Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening, perhaps, uh, to all our participants in this uh, first webinar, this first session of our series of workshops on uh, the governance of artificial intelligence today, the risk-based approach to the regulation of AI. Uh, let me welcome you in the name of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the Green Foundation from Germany, linked to the German Greens. My name is Axel Hanait Sievers. I'm heading our office in Hong Kong. We, as Heinrich Böll Stiftung, Heinrich Böll Foundation, are an organization that uh, dedicated to dialogue and networking on themes that are the heart of green thinking and the green global movement, issues of sustainability, environmental and climate policy, but also social issues such as uh, public participation, gender rights, women's rights, and so on. We work in Germany with our headquarters in Berlin and with about 35 offices all over the world, including Beijing, New Delhi, Bangkok, and we have a European office in Brussels, where our moderator of today, Ms. Zora Siebert, is based. Uh, our Hong Kong office is pretty new, started only about two years ago. It's dedicated to develop dialogue and exchange between Asia and Europe on themes of common concern. Issues of technology, environment, and social change are at the heart of it. And obviously, this event that starts here today uh, discusses emerging approaches to the regulation of uh, artificial intelligence is a very classical example of the kind of dialogue that we are trying to bring about with an audience from different parts of, and time zones of the world. So welcome again. We're especially happy to, co uh, to cooperate in this with the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, APRU, uh, hoping to tap into each other's ideas and networks. And so I wish to thank uh, Mrs. Christina Schönlieber, the Senior Director of Policy and Programs at APRU, uh, for joining us here. And I will hand over the mic to her, figuratively speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Axel, for the nice introduction. As you just heard, um, I'm Christina Schönlieber, Senior Director of Policy and Programs at the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, also based in Hong Kong. And on behalf of the association, I would like to welcome our really distinguished panel speakers and the moderator and the audience for this first discussion session of the three-part series organized in partnership with the Heinrich Boy Foundation. Now, the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, or in short, APU, is a network of 60 leading research universities, all based along the Pacific Rim. Our members and their scientists are based in 19 countries or economies across Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, Asia, and the West Coast of Canada, the US, and Latin America. And our network or association was established close on 25 years ago with the aim for universities and scientists to collaborate with external stakeholders from government, industry, and multilateral organizations, and very specifically support the development of the Asia Pacific region. Now, this is still our objective, our key objective today. What has changed is the focus of our support. I would suggest probably 25 years ago, the focus was on economic development. Now, the most pressing challenges that we as APAU address by bringing together scientists with our external partners are sustainability, environmental and societal challenges. Now, with this in mind, APU, in collaboration with and under the leadership of Professor Kokoryu, Tiro Kokoryu from K University, set up about seven years ago the APU Digital Economy Program. And I'm very pleased to say that Professor Kokoryu is also one of the panelists. And after bringing together a network of experts and partners, um, during that network, or when we set up, the first project exploring the impact of AI on society was set up soon after. And I'm even more pleased to say that both our academic expert speakers today, Professor Toby Walsh and Professor Jiro Kokoryu, were the co-leads on this very first two-year project, where key issues such as possible and unacceptable risks of AI technology, as well as opportunities this can offer to societies were explored. 
And then soon after, we also brought on board UNASCAP as a multilateral partner to expand this discussion to governments and other policy stakeholders of this region. And we are now on our fourth project where we look to apply what we have learned over the past several years in partnership with governments agencies to actively support the development and implementation of regulatory frameworks and policies that ensure that AI technology is used for the good of society. And for this, we work together still with UNASCAP and now the Thai government and the government of Bangladesh. So why technology has changed and further developed to a great extent over these past seven years, which seems a long time now. But what hasn't changed is that artificial intelligence has the potential for to benefit human mankind enormously. But however, if mismanaged, it also has the potential to harm possibly humanity in catastrophic ways, which we explored in that first project. So therefore, it now seems to be perfect timing to bring together experts from Europe who are in the unique position to debate and implement region-wide regulatory frameworks with leading thinkers on AI from the highly diverse Asia-Pacific region to broaden the discussion how societies support governments and key stakeholders and can ensure that the impact of artificial intelligence will be positive and further enhance societal good. And now to this regard, I really want to thank again the colleagues from the Heinrich Bell Foundation for this partnership here in Hong Kong and for all the speakers today for their participation who have joined us and also all the colleagues and participants. And I shall hand over to our moderator of today, to Sora Siebert. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much, Axel. My name is Zora Siebert. I am the head of the EU Democracy and Digital Policy Program at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Brussels. And today's topic is the risk-based approach of AI regulation and the transformative change that AI could be bringing. When we look at the EU, it is an important player when it comes to policymaking and global standard setting. In April 2021, the European Commission published the EU AI Act, and this marks an important step uh, to regulate such technologies. It will have probably a wider legislative impact in other parts of the world as well. Um, international cooperation is very important. And for example, ahead of the EU, US Tech and Trade and Technology Council, we see that policymakers from the EU and the US have been very keen to align on AI policy. Today, we will look at the progress of the EU AI Act and the very recent European Parliament's um, draft report by the Internal Market and Home Affairs Committee, which marks the blueprint of the EU vision on AI. This AI Act promises more transparency, more accountability and more explainability. At the core of the proposal is the concept of risk, and that's what we are going to talk about today as well. We are wondering which types of AI constitute an unacceptable risk that should be strictly prohibited and how can these areas de be defined clearly? What kind of ex applications should be completely exempted when it comes to AI? To explore these and other important questions, we have an excellent panel here from Australia, the EU and Japan. And let me just introduce our speakers very briefly to you. So first of all, we will hear from Toby Walsh, who is a Ciencia Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of South Wales in Australia. He is a strong advocate for the limits to ensure AI is used to improve our lives. Then we will hear from Alexandra Gese, German member of the European Parliament for the Greens IFA group. Alexandra Gese is a digital expert and member of the European Parliament's Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee. And she was also the Green Coordinator of the Special Committee on AI and the Digital Age. And last but not least, we will hear from Iru Kokuryu, Professor at the Faculty of Policy Management at KU University, Japan. His research and teaching interests are focused on developing business and social models that maximize the benefits of information technologies to society. Before we get started with the debate, a few housekeeping notes. You have seen it in the chat already. This event will be recorded. And we'll have, first of all, we'll have three five minutes inputs with a few follow up questions. And I invite the audience to post also questions in the QA tool at the bottom of your screen, and we will add them to the debate. So 
Now I'll hand over to Professor Walsh and Professor Walsh, I would like to know what do you think about the EU AI Act? Do you think once this uh, law is adopted, this first comprehensive EU um, AI regulatory framework, uh, what kind of impact will it have on the world? What is, what is your take on it? Uh, well, in, interestingly, I've, I've argued in the past that um, the appropriate way to regulate AI is not in a generic way, but since it's a platform technology, it is, it is going to be very much like electricity. It's going to be in all our devices, in all aspects of our lives. Um, the, just as we don't have a generic regulation for electricity, we probably don't need generic regulation for AI. But so I'm surprised to find myself relatively welcoming to the idea of the EU AI. I don't think it's going to cover all the harms that AI is going to is going to introduce into our societies, and we will have to think of um, other forms of, of regulation and standards and norms to, to, to deal with those. But um, I actually think it will set an important precedent, um, and I think it I think the risk based approach is actually. Um, a, a very suitable, appropriate one. Of course, the devil is in the details. It depends how it's going to be applied. Um, and it depends, especially, uh, the sorts of resources the EU is going to have, the sorts of expertise the EU is going to have, because um, the sorts of people, that, uh, the sorts of corporations that are being um, regulated have vast resources. Um, and uh, one is one somewhat worried that it might be um, rather one-sided um, and um, therefore, it will be interesting to see how it plays out. But, but broadly speaking, I think it's a welcome development. And what we have seen um, in other regulations like the GDPR is that they are very viral. Um, California now has its own version of the GDPR. Um, and we can expect, therefore, this to be very viral. So it is going to set, um, for better or for worse, a very important precedent. Thank you. Thank you so much. And maybe uh, a brief follow up questions on that one. So you've been very vocal in the past uh, and in your books when it comes to the ban of autonomous weapons. Why, why do you think that certain types of AI should be banned? Can, can you give us some more examples of AI that you think is too dangerous for our society and to be deployed? Yes. Uh, well, I, I I don't think there's many types of AI that should be completely prohibited. Um, even um, applications of AI like facial recognition, you can, you can come up with good uses of those of technologies. I mean, for example, there was a wonderful case in Delhi where the police went into thousands of orphanages and reunited thousands of lost children with their parents. So that was a, a wonderful good. And another example is the use of facial recognition software to, um, to combat child and sex trafficking on the internet. You can't scan all the faces on the internet with human eyes, but you can do it with computer eyes. Um, so I, I wouldn't argue that all facial recognition needs to be banned. Uh, um, AI is typically a dual use technologies, the good uses and bad uses, but there are some things I think where it's very black and white. Um, and handing the ability for machines to decide who lives or who dies is an example of one of those things where it's black and white. It's black and white, for two very good reasons. One is the machines are not accountable. Machines are not moral beings. They, they have no conscience. They can't be punished. Um, it would be a dreadful mistake to, to give them such responsibility when they cannot be held account for their actions. Um, humans can only be held account for actions. So there are some things um, like autonomous weapons which would change the character and nature of warfare in a terrible way. Um, and I, I believe it, the world would be a much better place if we, if we drew very strong red lines. And that's one of the things actually I welcome about the EU AI Act, that it is saying that there are some red lines we could draw. Um, and there are other places where we don't want regulation to get in the way. We want, we want innovation, we want economic growth and prosperity. And um, so I think it's actually quite, quite a, a good uh, marriage to, to work out, well, there are some technologies that we can, we can leave w well away and there are others where where we will need to regulate to varying degrees of severity. Thank you very much, Professor Walsh. I'm sure we will come back to some of, of the points that you mentioned later in the discussion. Now I'd like I would like to hand over to Alexandra Gese. Um, 
Alexandra, can you uh, tell us what's your uh, take on the EU IAC? And maybe can you shed some more light on this risk-based approach that we heard about? What, what is this exactly? What are the unacceptable risks? And do you think it's nuanced enough or is it, is it too broad? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dora, and good, good morning or hello to everybody. It's morning in Europe, but not uh, in Hong Kong, I suppose. Um, very happy to be here. First of all, um, the, the European Commission, and I think this is, this is shared by, by most stakeholders in this, what we want to have is human-centric and trustworthy AI. And the vice president of the European Commission, Margaret Vestager, who was very much invested in this, in this act, says on AI, trust is a must, not a nice to have. And in Europe, we pride ourselves to be very strong on fundamental rights, on democracy. And we want artificial intelligence that is at the service of the people. So what do we need the AI Act for? We don't need it to establish new rights. And I think uh, Professor Walsh's image of electricity was, was really, really interesting. What we want is an act that allows us to enforce the existing fundamental rights that we enjoy in Europe in a world where AI is pervasive. Um, and going back to the idea of electricity, I think the idea is basically, it, we want to be the ones to switch the light on and off or the electricity on and off and not having some kind, something, some kind of machine behind us that decides when the lights in our living room or in our bathroom are on or off. Um, so we absolutely do welcome the idea of the AI Act. What we did expect politically, and I'm speaking as a politician here, not as an academic, was a discussion on the very fundamental questions that artificial intelligence raises for society. For example, in terms of surveillance, um, this act um, was under the influence of the images that we, when these Europeans, we followed very closely the Hong Kong protests and all everybody working here on artificial intelligence had in mind the images of the smart lampposts. And that's, we said, well, this is what we do not want in Europe. Um, the issue of bias, we know that artificial and intelligence tools are trained mostly with data from the past and therefore projects prejudice uh, from the past or distribution of power from the past into the future. And this is something we do not want. And, um, we do want to ask the question whether some techniques like emotional recognition, like recognition of sexual orientation, do are, are, comp are compatible with, with the European idea of fundamental rights. So this is what politically we ex expected. Uh, what we did get was basically a product certification regulation. We are very proud of uh, our product safety and uh, consumer protection systems in Europe. And this is basically what we got on AI, which is perfectly fine for the majority of AI, AI tools that are used in within technical system, within production system in order to control energy grids. I think that the really the large part of, of AI will be used there. And therefore a product certification and product safety regulation is perfectly fine. What I was missing was, and what I have been asking for, is a distinction of artificial intelligence tools that are used in technological systems and to regulate uh, technology and AI systems that are used to choose to discriminate, to uh, classify human beings, which I think um, is, is, very, is very dangerous and the societal risk and the risk of fundamental rights are not adequately reflected in the AI Act. So how does it work? We have, uh, Dora asked for, um, for the risk-based approach, um, which we think is a, is a very good approach. First of all, there are some applications that are completely prohibited. Um, one of them is actually 
the use of real time, and I quote, remote biometric identification system. So what we call uh, facial recognition, but it's not only facial, you can also recognize people from behind, from the way they walk and so on. But in publicly accessible spaces, that's important. And there is an exception for finding missing children, as Professor Walsh uh, pointed out, that might make sense, absolutely. What we are criticizing is that there are further exceptions that are so broad that it's very difficult to understand whether this is a ban actually, or whether this isn't a ban. Um, and actually in Europe, we, always we already have a ban, in the practical ban in place, according to our general data protection regulation, you already have to have an authorization to run uh, biometric identification systems in publicly accessible spaces, and there are only very few of them. So this might even go into the, the, the opposite direction. Um, we have a ban on, on social scoring. Um, so what, what in Europe we call Chinese style social, uh, Chinese style social, social scoring, um, but that is quite limited as well. And then a couple of more things that are quite complicated. So for example, deploying subliminal techniques beyond a person's consciousness if those techniques uh, distort a person's behavior in a way to cause physical or psychological harm. Um, you see, it's very difficult to prove that all these conditions are fulfilled. Um, so we would have wanted other practices to be prohibited as well, and I might come back to that later. Um, then there's a second class, which is called high risk, which high risk systems, we have a long list of specific applications, um, which comprise biometric identification, education, employment, essential private services, public services, uh, public services and benefits. Think social welfare, for example, detecting social welfare fraud. Um, da, 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 law enforcement, migration asylum, border management, administration of justice. And I think one area that miss, is missing here are medical services, which can decide over life and death. And I was wondering why they are not included and I didn't get any answers on this. The problem here is that this means basically that in some cases, company can check for certain conditions to be fulfilled and then issue a certification themselves. In other cases, they have to present the documentation to a notifying body. Notifying bodies in Europe are used to certify the safety of products. So they are very ex they are experts on the safety of products, on consumer protection, making sure we have a safe product on the internal market. But they are not experts in democracy, in bias, in discrimination, and protecting fundamental rights. Um, so I think we have an issue here um, that this act is not really fulfilling what it is supposed to fulfill. And then we have to come to an end because I think I'm, I'm over time. Um, we have the low risk class where AI tools can basically be placed on the market and then we see later whether there's a damage or not. And I stop here and maybe we come back with other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. We will definitely come back uh, because I also have a couple of follow up questions for you, but uh, we want to give everyone the chance to speak. So I'll pass over to Professor Kukuryu. Um, Professor Kukuryu, what is your take on the EU AI Act? And can you please also tell us a bit more about um, AI regulation in Japan and in East Asia and how this differs maybe from, from the European point of view? Well, thank you very much for this, uh, this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it, uh, and and uh, it's, it's, it's a great honor to be, to be part of this. Um, I, I think my role today is to, uh, to provide an alternative thinking uh, from the East. And uh, in, in, in that spirit, uh, a, a suggestion I'd like to make today is that perhaps we should aim at uh, building an ecosystem in which humans, nature, and machines live happily together, uh, instead of trying to build a world in which humans unilaterally control machines and or nature. And uh, actually, this has been the thinking in 2016 uh, behind naming a Jap Japan Technology Agency's program on AI ethics 
the awareness towards AI ethics became very clear in Japan also around that time. Uh, we, uh, but the, uh, we named it the uh, Human Info Information Technology Ecosystem. And uh, I have been serving as uh, its uh, proper program supervisor for, uh, for the uh, last seven years or so. And the message behind the naming of this has been that uh, society and technology could uh, and should co-evolve convivially. In other words, social institutions include ethical standards should be allowed to evolve as uh, technology advances. So, so the message is that this, this should not be a static process, but this is, this is going to be a dynamic process or whatever ongoing things. And that this is not to say, of course, that the technology should be left alone to evolve without consideration to uh, ethical issues. Uh, to be precise, um, let me uh, not mislead you. Uh, Japanese government official policy uh, for, uh, follows the European lead in support of human-centric approach to ensure that the technology uh, will be used to uphold the human dignity. That's the core. Uh, and uh, while the Japanese attitude so far has been adopting soft law approach, relying on guidelines to ask the industry to uh, voluntarily comply, uh, its thinking has firmly been on, on, on the protection of human rights. So we are, we, we are going along with the EU uh, completely on that. And the risk-based approach, uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks again to the EU leadership, uh, is also agreeable. In fact, one of the key goals of the uh, Human Information Technology Ecosystem Program has been to develop capability, uh, better capability uh, for risk assessment, uh, for dynamically evolving uh, technology. So to, to identify potential risks as things go on, uh, we also assume that the society changes uh, along the way and, uh, and give prompt feedback uh, to, to engineers. Uh, if there is a difference, uh, it probably exists in the animistic tradition of Japan that leads to accept persona, even in, in machines. Uh, reflective of such sentiments, characterization of robots in jo Japanese animations have largely been friendly, particularly with children. Uh, and this is reflective of uh, the animistic uh, thinking that considers humans merely as part of cosmos, rather than being at the center or on top of it. And that I would argue that such a worldview is useful in a world of uh, increasing complexity. Uh, by complex world, uh, I mean a world in which various elements are networked and influence each other to make behavior of the global system increasingly unpredictable. And I think that was uh, what Toby uh, was talking about. Uh, in other words, it's impossible to be in complete control. Uh, animism humbly accepts such vulnerable reality of the humans and respect the nature we live in uh, and not to think we can control uh, nature or machines uh, on our own. Uh, now, this can be contrasted to the uh, philosophies of uh, industrial process control of the modern factory. Uh, that controls the environment to recreate phenomena exactly as intended and theorized. And even, even before artificial intelligence, digital networks have been ushering machines to postmodernize and be part of this complex system of, of, of cosmos. I guess in conclusion, uh, I am preaching for dynamic resilience instead of control. Uh, such attitude requires constant monitoring of emerging risks of technology and our willingness to adapt to the environment uh, as well as uh, to enact upon technology so that uh, technology can, can, can uh, be of uh, benefits to the human being. So I guess that's my initial remark. 
Thank you very much. That's a fascinating perspective. And I think it's not so far away from actually what the other panelists have been saying as well. I've seen there are already a couple of questions in the Q&A tool. So uh, please don't be shy in the audience. You can post in more. I have a couple of follow-up questions as well. Um, maybe uh, for the panelists, if you want to come back on what uh, the other speakers have said, please uh, just give me a sign and I'll, I'll give you a word. I'll, I'll just have a, a quick follow up for Alexandra Giese. And that was also something uh, Professor Walsh touched upon. Uh, when it comes to the enforcement and the resources that are allocated to the enforcement of the law, do you think that in the AI Act they, they have done it well as it is foreseen? Or do you think they're repeating the same mistake as they did with the GDPR that we have this kind of bottleneck situation where a very small agency is responsible for the enforcement? I know you have a lot of experience also with other European laws. So how, how is it done here? And is there maybe, is this an improvement to what has happened with the GDPR? Well, actually, I'm afraid it's it's not an improvement. I just worked quite a lot on enforcement on a different um, legislative act, which is the Digital Services Act, which regulates the internet, the big platforms, the online platforms, and then we worked a lot on enforcement. And in the AI Act, um, and there we decided in the end that for very large companies, um, the enforcement would be done by the European Commission. And this came, this was not in the original proposal by the European Commission, but came, came in later by council actually, which is extremely interesting for, for the non-Europeans. Usually the council as the representation of the governments of the European member states, and they usually want all competences to lie with the, the member states governments and not with the European Commission. And in this case, um, they turned it around and said, well, for the very large online platforms, um, the, the enforcement should be done by the European Commission and not by our own agencies and authorities. And this is something that is not in the AI Act. And I'm very worried because um, basically a company can get an authorization by a notifying body in any country. And then once it has that, the application can be rolled out everywhere. So one thing that is concerning us is, for example, we have at least two countries in the EU where we have formal procedures because um, they breach fundamental rights um, of the EU, uh, but which they have signed up for when they, when they at, the, at the time of access to the succession to the EU, um, which are Poland and Hungary. So, and, and especially Poland has a policy um, against LGBTIQ people. So if you have, for example, an, an application that recognizes sexual orientation and allows them to discriminate against these people, you might not get an authorization for that in Sweden, but you might get it in Poland very easily, and then you can use the application all over Europe. And I think that is a very, very serious issue that we, we, we will need to look at in the process. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Walsh, you raised your hand. Please go yes. ahead. I, I just wanted to say we, we, we had largely um, positive comments about a risk-based approach. And I just want to offer a, a word of caution, a risk of risk-based approaches, which is that with these digital technologies, it is actually often very difficult to predict outcomes. Um, un unintended consequences are rife within the field. Um, and as, as an example, um, people, people talk about um, the risks of of, um, of with social media of um, QAnon and social and for fake news and, and and all of the polarization that we see, um, and blame the algorithm, the machine learning algorithm that, that is uh, governing the uh, our news feeds. Um, and actually, I'm starting to think that it's not the algorithm, that whatever algorithm we substituted in there we would have that. It's a fundamental flaw in the design of the system that if you have a system based upon likes and retweets and so on, whatever algorithm you put in there, if the, if the algorithm is doing something, it will actually end up polarizing debate. Um, and that was a very much an unintended consequence. I'm sure no, no one predicted at the outset, but not the designers of the systems, that it was going to encourage these bad behaviors. 
And so I think one of the risks that we face is that um, of unintended consequences, because these, these technologies do let us break things in ways that we've never broken before, because they work at, at speeds and scales and costs that can completely change the equations. Thank you, Professor Walsh. Um, I think there's also a question by Axel Hernet Sievers, right? I saw it in the chat that you also had a question, or at least one question. If you want to pose it, please go ahead. Oh, I can, I'm allowed to uh, ask uh, live. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, I have one question to Toby and one to Alexandra, which of a very different type. But Toby, you mentioned the uh, this issue of ban on autonomous, on entirely autonomous weapons. And of course, I understand, I mean, I think we fundamentally agree on this aim. But on the other hand, I mean, of course, there may be a gray zone where we say certain starting points, starting decisions are made by humans, but then the execution of something is left to AI supported processes, which will in the end target particular objects or so how do we handle this kind of gray zone between processes started by humans, but finalized then by automatic um uh, by by yeah by automatic procedures that's my question to talk okay let me just ask this question yeah, that's, that's that's a great question and you're, and you're right it, it is very much a gray zone and we already have various technologies that we use that are starting to blur that line um i think the the discussion at the U, un at the cc ccw actually was going along a very good direction which is this idea um of meaningful human control you have to ask, is there meaningful human control so that there is accountability for a human, that there is a possibility that the human is taking responsibility and can take responsibility. It is, is meaning that, that they have you know, meaningful understanding of the situation um, and can be responsible for whatever goes right or goes wrong. And if I may ask a question to Alexandra, which is a, coming in from a very different end about the practical politics of this, isn't there a risk if you allow a risk based approach towards banning, well, well to, to regulation, to, to ban certain uh, AI applications, that this opens a floodgate to all types of demands of certain groups which find this, or this aspect of, of, of potential AI application or that one particularly dangerous, demanding a ban so that in the end, you will arrive at a situation that there are enormous amounts of demands for bans of very specific applications uh, and no proper way anymore to, to, to manage this politically. Yeah? So that, that becomes a hotpot of a long wish list uh, that uh, becomes, in the end, pretty incoherent or actually unfeasible to implement politically. What's your experience in the in the parliamentary process right now with this? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, Axel. Very relevant. Uh, my experience is exactly the contrary, actually, because there is a lot of pressure from the industry, from the country, from the companies, not to have prohibitions of any kind, because they say, um, and that makes sense to a certain extent, well, it depends on how you apply technology and depends on the context, and therefore a total ban doesn't make sense. Um, and in the, when you discuss AI, it's very difficult. I mean, 90% of the voices you hear come from the corporations and a little, a very small share comes from civil society. and. So I don't, I don't really see that risks. And in the AI Act, there would be a list of prohibited practices. We already have that, uh, four, I think, um, that are very much restricted. The first two, speaking about vulnerable, vulnerability, vulnerable, vulnerabilities, I'm sorry, and so on. I mean, the, the conditions to fulfill are so ambitious that it would be very difficult, will be very difficult to prove that in court. So I really don't see that. I'm rather, and my, my political group, we are the ones who have the wish list for prohibitions we would like to see, which I think we need in order to comply with fundamental rights. To give you some examples, um, things like biometric categorization systems versus gender recognitions, for example, which is a product that seems to be very much on book, although the experts say it's basically snake oil, it doesn't work. 
Um, we had that, yeah, we, we had that. I mean, in Europe, we had Lombroso in the 18th century and I uh, said, well, you can say whether, tell whether people are criminals by looking at their, at their features. Um, and now this is coming back haunting us. Emotion recognition systems. I mean, European feel they don't want their emotions recognized by machines. Um, I don't think we should have that. And the majority of Europeans doesn't want that. A constant monitoring at work uh, education, which is starting to be a practice actually in private companies to have a camera constantly more monitoring you when you're working from home, for example. And people in Europe are not comfortable with this. And I don't think we should have that. So um, I think there are some prohibitions we, we should have in Europe. This is what, what Europeans feel they need to, to protect their democracy. So I don't, I don't see the big wish list for the prohibitions. What I think is a point here is the total dependency of whether an AI violates fundamental rights or not. That is that depends on the dynamics on how the product evolves, the tool evolves because it's dynamic. So the what the thing you certify in the beginning might be something doing something con, con, completely different a year later because if it's if it's on if it's machine learning. Um, so the cultural context. Uh, I'd like to come back to that. For example, I, I discussed this two years ago with Vice President Vestager, and she said, well, in terms of medical services, for example, um, an absolutely low risk system would be a system to assign appoint medical appointments. Um, we have the problem that, you know, this binds a lot of capacities uh, for a doctor just to make the appointments and to decide who should go first when you have limited capacities. And she said, but well, she's from Denmark. Uh, which is a country with a very broad social system and where all people have the same kind of medical insurance. Um, so she says, well, you train the data based on what has been done before and then the AI optimizes it. So the patients that need the appointment first or a certain kind of medical exam first will get it first. And that's a great system. That's a system that saves lives. And I'm from Germany and we have a double track insurance system. We have private insurance and public insurance and they're both good, but people who are privately insured uh, pay a lot more. And so they get their medical appointments a lot earlier because it's a profit for doctors. It's not that the public insurance people are not adequately treated, but they, they wait longer. So if you train a system with the existing data, data, private insured people will get their appointments first, regardless of medical necessity. And it might be a system that kills people. So it would be very high risk in Germany. And it's basically the same system. Um, and that's something that is, that is complicated. So I think the solution here goes more in the direction of having transparency. So the producer of the system and who applies the system has to set out what are the goals of the system? How is it optimized? What it is supposed to do? And how is it supposed to achieve that? And then, or you open up the black box and you are able to look at the data and the algorithms, or when that is not possible, um, you check it regularly. It needs to be regularly checked if the outcome actually fulfills the expectations and the goals that were set in the beginning. I think that that should work. And especially when the system decides over people and over people's access to medical services, for example, this is what we need, and this is not included in, in the regulation. So I think that the big discussion is not that much about what should be prohibited, um, but how do we make sure that we see clearly what the goals are and if the system actually fulfills this goal? And how can we make sure that especially the most affected groups are participating in that process? Thank you very much. Now I see a hand of uh, Professor Kukuyu. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I am supportive of uh, uh, of the Toby's uh, what Toby said about uh, the meaningful intervention by human beings uh, uh, on critical decisions, particularly on those things where accountability and responsibility uh, is, uh, is is very important. Uh, I think in in today's context uh, for high risk. Uh, kind of uh, kind, kinds of uh, applications of the uh, of the technology. My question to Alexandra uh, is uh, whether that kind of I mean it, it, it's it's in the uh, risk based approach that that uh, in the, in the EU AI Act uh, is, is that kind of philosophy uh, part of it? And uh, 
my question to Toby is that uh, I mean we are the humans are already overwhelmed by amount of, I mean uh, data or uh, more more information so simply overwhelm us and the reliance on this human simply relying on uh, human accountability and responsibility may be of uh, of, of serious constraint uh to the good uses of the technology uh if you have comment on that uh, i'd appreciate it. if i may just quickly follow up on this one professor kukuyo so earlier you were talking about the happy coexistence between machines and and humans and uh, the basis of new technologies and how it has to be assessed continuously and you were just addressing it yourself how can we make sure that governments actually are at speed with these kind of assessments to to accommodate these developments because they're already behind with the governance frameworks how how can we do that well as i said that has been part of my project of uh, trying to uh, do sort of real time risk assessment uh and and continuous dialogue uh and uh, and the efforts at i mean we have pretty much given up on the on the idea of social scientists trying to stop the technologists. Uh, instead, we've been th seriously thinking about how to update technologists uh, on, the, uh, on the ongoing discussion. So, so we, we really need to have uh, technologists that are aware of, uh, of, of, of these ethical issues rather than trying to uh, uh to to regulate to to set rules by the humanities and social social scientists so uh, it's a matter of more of a education and ongoing process rather than to try to uh, set a clear line uh, on anything beforehand so i mean i, I did, maybe this is a defeatist idea but i think we we think that's a that's a that's a practical approach now I'm not talking about the official Japanese government position, but um, that's been the thinking around my community. Thank you very much, Professor Walsh. Do you want to come back on that before we really get into the Q and A? Well, I think Alexandra had a question to answer for Jiro first, please. I did have a question to answer. It was a question um, on, on human oversight, and um, I'm happy to answer it positively. Yes, this is foreseen in the AI. It's also a very strong article, I have to say. It's Article 14, which I have welcomed very much, um, because it says um, the, the, the individuals to whom human oversight is assigned need to, to be able to fully understand the capacities and limitations of high-risk AI systems, be able to duly monitor its operation, uh, remain aware of the possibility tendency of automatically relying or over-relying on the output, um, to be able to correctly interpret the high-risk AI systems output. I mean, the bar is extremely high here, and I think that's good. It will be difficult to find individuals who are able to do this, but it's good to have it. Um, the only problem is, I'm a little bit worried about the implementation of this article um, because all studies show that humans usually don't like to override a machine's decision. And the risk is um, because you know we, we know we are imperfect and the machine doesn't know and we tend to recognize when it's a, well, when we are told the machine, machine is objective, we tend to recognize that. The other problem is when you introduce the AI tool, it sets standards, for example, in terms of timing. So um, if you have, as a judge, for example, and you're suppo supposed to put out a judgment every 10 minutes, and if you have, you can rely on the AI, you can do that. If you go against the AI decision, you have to write a justification for it, for example, and that takes you more time, it's more work, it's more time, and you might be in a routine where you can't do that even worse for a social worker or other kind of decision makers who are maybe like a cog in a machine in some kind of administration and don't really have, even if they have the formal uh, competence to do that, but they might not have the time, they might not be willing to writing justification. So it depends a lot 
on the role of this individual in the, in the production or the administrative process. And I think there is the danger that we focus so much on efficiency that that kind of human in the loop and of human oversight uh, will be nice on paper, but not working in, in practice. That's, that's my fear. Uh, can I make a comment on what, what Professor Kokuyo just said? Yes, Dora. but, pl but please um, be brief be, because we have a couple of questions. I try to be questions. brief, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit worried about, I mean, I, I would very much welcome the awareness of technologists on the ethical or fundamental rights as we say in Europe concerns, um, and I would very much welcome that. The problem is that we have seen that the individuals that really are aware and voice their concerns tend to lose their jobs. I mean, I'm just thinking of Timid Gebru and Google, and, and that's why I think we need very strong legislation because the corporations, I mean, I really like this image of animus and I never thought about it that way. So I was very, very happy for that, that input um, to my European mind. It's absolutely beautiful. But the problem is, as, as I think Professor Walsh, says, Walsh said, it's not the machine itself. They're, they are optimized for making profits by corporations, by real people. Uh, who then have that profits to spend and have a keen interest in making those profits and therefore technologists that have an awareness of those concerns and try to implement it in their pro, uh, pro process and processes and raise awareness in their corporation tend not to stay there very long that's the problem that's a very important point of concern that you made here um professor walsh up to you yeah, thank you i i just wanted to to express some words of caution against transparency. We've seen a lot of um, discussion around transparency and the benefits of transparency, but I want to point out first of all a technical concern, which is that there may be systems which cannot be made transparent. Um, human vision is not transparent, and I'm very doubtful that we'll ever be able to make computer vision systems much more transparent and explain why they recognize this as a uh, as a stop sign and not a go sign. Um, this there may be a technical reason that we can't make the system more transparent. And, and, and secondly, the transparency, I, don't, I think, is rather overrated. Um, my doctor, for example, is not particularly transparent, yet I put my life in her hands. Um, I rely on the fact that there's institutions around her that ensure that I don't have to be a medical expert. I, I don't have to listen to her trying to explain, be transparent about her decision making. That's not a, a very... Uh, that, that wouldn't work. It's, it, it, I, um, I know that there are institutions there that if she kills too many of her patients, she'll be struck off the register. If she prescribes drugs that are dangerous, um, those drugs will, will be re removed. Um, and I think we want to realize that transparency isn't going to be the answer. Um, every year I read Facebook's transparency report and it fills me with no greater confidence that Facebook is behaving any better. That is very, very true as well. Uh, that made me laugh a little bit. <laughs> okay, now we're coming to the Q&A from the audience. So we, we have a couple of questions and I'm trying to summarize them a bit for you. So the first one was about um, data protection, privacy laws, and also data security and how it affects the development and adoption and implementation, implementation of AI. Um, who would like to go first on this one? And maybe we can add to this the other question about standardization. So technical standardization and technical standardization bodies. What is their role in this EU AI Act and what role should they play? Because they're very heavily uh, dominated by industry and civil society doesn't really get much of a say here. Would someone like to tackle this question? Professor Walsh, first, should we go first? Yeah. I'll do the first question on data, which is a great question because, of course, many advances in AI are being driven by machine learning. Machine learning is heavily dependent upon data. I think what's a, what's a very interesting um, development there is that, is that we're now seeing that um, you know, cases where, where people have acquired data in places that they shouldn't have, not only is that data being destroyed, but also the models that um, have built from that data are being destroyed as well. And I think we're, we're going to see a lot more um, such, such uses of, of the law that go beyond just the data and actually um, require that the tech companies destroy the models that they've built that data on. Uh, 
Thank you, Professor Kokuyo. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I know time is running out. So let me pose this question instead of my final comment to Alexandra, uh, which is uh, in look, looking at the situation, European situation from, from this side of the, uh, the, the continent, uh, the relationship between the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act and the this current AI uh, Act, uh, they seem to be have a, a slightly different philosophical, I mean, sort of legal uh, logic behind it. And uh, I, I, should we be worried about consistency among these, including the traditional data regulations? Or uh, are, are you, I mean, is that already sorted out in, in Europe? I think that's a perfect question for Alexandra Geze. I mean, there are uh, obviously there are links to the GDPR as well and to to privacy laws. Can you get into this, please? I, I can try. I'm not a lawyer. I'm I'm a politician, so I look more at the political side of it than at the academic or, or legal side of it. Um, there was a discussion on how the AI Act relates um, to the DSA specifically more than to the DMA. The DMA is more about market power and competition, so I would leave it a little bit out of the discussion. But obviously, um, one of the most well-known application of AI are the algorithms that govern social networks and, and the internet. Um, there was a discussion and there was actually a first leaked draft uh, by the European Commission that included a, a very vague description that could have been applied to, to Facebook and Google algorithms, absolutely, especially social networks. Um, it was not in the final draft that the commission presented. So there probably was that, that awareness that it was not a good idea to regulate the same thing in two different acts. Um, so at the moment, I, I think we are, we are trying to address everything related to, to social networks in the DSA including the algorithmic part where we have a specific article 26 in the Digital Services Act um, saying that the corporations have to do risk assessments that include the functioning by which um, we intend sort of the algorithms and their optimization and the business model and so on. Um, Why the AI Act doesn't mention them specifically. I think that's sort of the division of labor um, then, obviously, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and I think the legal experts are working on it and trying to sort it out and their cross references and so on. And I think they're trying to sort it out on a non technical level. So I'm not sure there might be other points where the two acts touch themselves. And it's in the end, we have the European Court of Justice, which would have to decide in, in case um, there, there is a clash or, or a non, um, an inconsistency between the two pieces of legislation. Uh, GDPR obviously always applies, um, so that the general data protection regulation, which is sort of our Bible in Europe, um, so that would um, be um, would still apply, and the AI Act refers to it, the DSA refers to it. We had rather a little bit the contrary problem that um, we have some issues with implementation of GDPR in Europe, that it is well implemented in some countries and not so well in others. Among those, that country where um, the big giants of AI and social networks are headquartered, which is a problem. And we tried to regulate that in the DSA and the commission was very much against it because they fear that that could harm the implementation of the General Data Protection Act actually. So yes, that, it, it is an issue, I think between the DSA and the AI Act, it, it could work. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I think uh, what you just said and the uh, question of meaningful human control, that is a very good example that goes across several European laws that we're seeing at the moment, the DSA and the EU AI Act. So we had one, one comment in the, the Q&A that it's 
the scalability is the problem because it might just not be feasible with the amount of posts, for example, that we're seeing on, on social networks. So uh, I think it's very interesting that we have very similar questions on different legislative proposals. And yeah, thanks for, for getting into this. I'm afraid that we are unfortunately running out of time for our discussion now, but I do hope that the uh, debate has kind of reshaped and broadened our understanding of risk when it comes to AI a bit more. And it's it's not only about data, it is a lot about data, but we are also talking about fundamental rights, risks. We are talking about risks for the environment, bias in terms of migration. So big risks for society. So it, it's all important. It's not only about the connection to uh, our fundamental right, which is data protection. And yeah, I find it very interesting that uh, we can have these different perspectives from, from Europe, Australia, and uh, Japan today. And I hope that we can continue this exchange because I don't think that we will have one world governance of AI one day. There will be many different, or at least a couple of legislative jurisdictions that will have their own uh, rules, but it's very important that there are alliance between them and that they talk to each other. So I thank everybody very much for their attention, for this conversation and for the questions. And last but not least, please don't forget that this is an um, event series and there are two more upcoming webinars the next one is on 25th of may and it's going to be on the explainable unexplainable ai and the third one is going to be on data protection and the rights for citizens and users when it comes to ai so thank you very much everyone and have a lovely rest of your day and evening wherever you are